name's Brian Woodward. Uh, I'm a, I guess, co-founder, chief architect at a company called Cellside. Um, we're uh, building out our app right now. And originally we had been using Angular, but um, we're slowly migrating things over to Ember just because it fits into our build stack a little bit better because uh, we use handlebars templates a lot. Um, but uh, some things that we do is, um, is like with notifications, so like the pub sub type uh, things. And um, we have, uh, you know, we want to be able to have different clients, be client like is in the web browser clients, be able to get the notifications when something happens on the server in real time without having to pull all the time. And um, there's a, a third party app out there called Pusher. And um, so I built this module to be able to uh, integrate Pusher into Angular by wrapping the commands um, and uh, to be able to get those messages. So um, I don't have like a real technical presentation, but I've got the code I can show. Uh, Pusher is like a pub sub, like, you know, uh, pub sub type thing where you can um, subscribe to different channels and messages to be able to get the messages. And um, it's similar to a few like Firebase type uh, deal, or there's, um, I think there's a couple other services out there. Uh, let me see. Pusher, side. Pusher is um, it's a hosted service, and then there's uh, there's libraries for all <coughs> server side technology uh, things like so, Python, Ruby, JavaScript, C sharp, uh, Java. And then uh, there's also client-side API for um, JavaScript. Um, by default, it's just being able to subscribe to messages, but then you can set up uh, private channels um, with tokens to be able to actually push to messages from the client side. But I think the, the main use case is that you send a message down to your server, and then that pushes it out to the um, pusher service, and then that um, all the other clients would subscribe to it and listen to it. So. Let me see. How does that look? Um, but so Pusher or Angular Pusher is just a, a single module. And uh, I just wanted to discuss some of the things that I found when working with or building a, a module for Angular. And that's really what I wanted to talk about was um, one thing is with namespacing. I don't know if people have run into this, but uh, you would think if you named um, your module something, you know, just like if I would have just named it Pusher or just, you know, something like that, then uh, there could have been name conflicts with other services if you pull those in there. Um, you see that a lot with like UI components, like if you just have calendar or things like that. So um, I think that Angular doesn't really namespace their modules as well. Um, but this, uh, there's a provider that's set up. And all the, what the provider does is uh, set up a way to be able to pull in a default pusher uh, API onto the uh, client side. So, so you don't have to actually drop it into your page, but you can, um, you can set up a different URL if you'd like to, to be able to get a newer version of the API than what this provides. And then the meat of it is uh, inside the uh, dollar get where it's just basically saying that when the window is loaded um, or like after after the script is loaded to uh, initialize a new pusher object and um, by using promises uh, we can later inside this factory uh, be able to register um, or be able to subscribe to different events on the pusher service um, couple of things that I'm doing here is when you subscribe from the uh, from the app you can pass in the channel name and you pass in a callback and because of uh, because we're binding that callback to the actual pusher service anytime a message comes in it's um, it's gonna go back to your controller and your app controller but I'm also uh, broadcasting a message on the uh, the root scope so you can so other types of uh, controllers or other things can um, subscribe to the internal broadcast system to be able to uh, make sure that, I mean, just to be able to listen on the different channels if you want to do that instead of having everything set up a callback. 
uh, and then to be able to make it work with a third-party app, you have to call you know, digest on the root scope, and then that way it allows the Angular to pick up the messages that's going to happen. So, I mean, it's, it's a fairly simple service. It's just wrapping the third-party part. <coughs> um, as an example, I've got a, uh, a controller that um, it's basically... Here, I'll show what it actually looks like. Let me, uh, let's see. If you guys can see this, um, there's basically just a page that is uh, that has a list of uh, items on here <laughs> and um, when you uh, update the quantity on uh, one side it uh, updates all the pages so the uh, the workflow of it is um, the angular app has a uh, has an update item uh, method on it that just uh, sends the, po the new item uh, name and quantity down to the server and uh, the server code sends it over um, has a connection that um, just triggers uh, a specific um, message on a, on a channel so we're saying that the item is updated and then I've got another activities channel that um, is showing how you can update the items in this list and then there's also let me see this activities stream that's going on so if you think about you know having a real-time activity stream that like if you're on some page like that or um, I'd really like to see a demo made where it's kind of like a, a mailbox where you can send messages to other people and you get the little notification icon that pops up and um, I think that this is kind of an alternative to using like web sockets or um, like socket IO if you use node or however you do it with uh, other technologies um, so then that you don't have that connection open on your server all the time that you can just push down whenever you want and then have that other service um, or connected to another service that's hosted to be able to get your um, messages. So, so this, the pusher is still using like a socket I/O, right? Something or a web socket. Do you know what, which yeah. one it's using to connect to the browser? I don't know what the their server side technology is, because um, they've got an API that's wrapped up. Uh, you can still access. You'd see it uh, in your network. That is not what I wanted to do. How do I open up? Alt command. Alt command. Uh, wrong page. And I close Chrome. All right. There, so um, so there's a pusher object on there that you can subscribe to, but uh, oh, you said network traffic to be able to see that. Let's see if I can. Yeah. And that one it just leaves open, right? Yeah, so you'll have a persistent connection to their servers. Um, but I think that mm. yeah, I think the benefit is that you don't have to worry about that on your own servers right. and uh and do that. So and then also you can still have it decoupled, so um if you wanna scale out your servers then all you're doing is pushing down to your service that's gonna send the messages around. Uh, but, um, <coughs> the, uh, 
So the con uh, the controller here is uh, just asking for the pusher service, or the which is the um, factory that's creating this, uh, uh, that's doing all the uh, part of loading in the scripts and actually you know setting up the actual pusher client, and then you just subscribe. So I'm subscribing to the items channel um, on updated, and then also subscribing to activities uh, when there's a new activity. And uh, everything else is just basic Angular where I've got a items array on my scope and I update the item. And then there's a activities array where I just uh, push an activity on there. Um, so one thing I learned also while doing this is uh, on the scope you can also listen to an event. Um, destroy so then if you have any resources that are open up that you want to be able to close down when you're so when your controller is destroyed and the scope is destroyed and that uh, controller you can shut down those other resources um, and but that's pretty much all I have on the module itself. I mean, if there's any questions about other types of Angular technology that I'm using, or yeah, I have a question. is there a reason why you use the digest instead of apply? Um, what was the question? Uh, why did I use digest instead of apply? Um, I think I think w if you just call digest, it'll it'll always just do the loop, right? And uh, But like apply, I think sometimes if you're already in the digest cycle, um, it throws errors. I'm not sure. I mean, so sometimes like some, you'll see like safe apply on a lot of things. And I could have probably done that where I check to see if it's already doing the cycle and done that, but. I thought digest would throw the error too if you were having digest. Really? I haven't seen it yet, so. Um, could be possible, but yeah, you know, I haven't seen that error like that. Um, uh, some of this. I guess the only thing I asked is I thought I read something somewhere that said you should pretty much always use apply. Okay. So I was just wondering. I don't know for sure. I don't know if anyone else knows if apply is better or. I think the only advantage that I read to apply is like if you were to wrap your broadcast thing in the apply. If an error happened during the broadcast, Angular would catch it. But the way you do it now, if an error happens there, Angular's error service isn't going to catch it or something like yeah, that. Yeah, so. On occasion, like an error applied to, you complained that it was already in the middle of the digest when apply was called. Well, that'll happen if you call digest twice, too. If yes, it's, it's that's on, true. So it doesn't matter. Yeah. So you're saying if I do something like this, yeah, and then put your broadcast in there. The chances of you getting an error during a broadcast are probably yeah, which not worth talking about. But you know, if you're just broadcasting it, you probably don't really care if there's an error because you just, I mean, you probably care more on the listener side if they get some error for, yeah. Because yeah. I don't know if this, uh, If doing this is similar to, I don't know if you're familiar with Node, like doing a the process next tick where it just waits another till the next loop or the next cycle of what it's doing, but. Okay. Um, that's my template for the page. I mean, that's what I like about a lot of these new technologies, how simple some of the templates can be for showing all the information and uh, just binding up the model and the actions that you have. Yeah, so this is hosted up on GitHub, um, and uh, there is a Bower component, uh, I think just Bower install Angular Pusher. Uh, 
doing Bower Component is something new to me, so I hope it gets updated properly. I think it is, but I'm not sure. Um, yeah, so there's a, actually, um, so in the Node environment, there's, you know, Yeoman, or Yaoman, um, and then there's a generator for an Angular module generator, and you can uh, do that, and um, they, uh, pretty much uh, the grunt file uh, just <coughs> can catch the, I mean, runs JS hints and then can catch uh, a couple things and um, together and minifies it for you. And then you can just take your regular Angular component JS and then the min.js and uh, put it on, or set them as files for Bower to be able to uh, find on GitHub, and then whenever you do a Bower install, it'll pull those down. And I think I guess I don't really have a good way of showing the example. So did you say you did use the Yaman template? Yeah, yeah, I use would um. It's a little different than what I expected because it, it makes your main branch, your GH pages branch. So if you're familiar with GitHub, that one, that's kind of like the, the branch that uh, you can see running. Um, like I can go, uh, so, <laughs> well, because there's no server connected to it, it's not going to pull back any data, but uh, you know, if you had a full, you know, static page, you could run it on GH Pages and have the, you know, your Angular app running on that. But I also put it up on Heroku, too. Um, so, so what kind of configuration do you have to do? Push your app? Push your uh, the pusher, so there is a, the pusher app, you, you basically sign up for it and you can get an app key. So you create a new app and then, the app key is uh, used to say which, uh, oh, I know. The, that's the problem is the, the app key shows like three different keys, so it's got the secret and everything. So uh, in so on the server side, um, to be able to connect, you have to have um, your app ID, uh, a key, and then the secret. And, um, and those you get from after you sign up with Pusher. And you can put them in there. I've got uh, a file that is get ignored, so it's not pushed up to GitHub. And uh, but um, basically, just has these three things on it. And uh, so then on the server, you can push to any channel that you want. On the client side, you have to set up. There's a key. I think it just uses the key. Um, sorry, I'm trying to remember where that is. Okay. So my my pusher service provider, which is the is where you can set your so like the the token is the key for the um, you know which can be exposed, and then you can set other options on there. So, and that's uh. Just having that tells you which one you're going to be subscribing to. So, so you do have to have your own node server. Uh, also, right, you can't just go directly from your client to push your uh, In some cases, you can. There's, uh, I th think you can set up um, kind of like an OAuth type thing so you can 
kind of do private channels on there. I haven't tried to implement that with this yet, just because, um, yeah, the, I had the same thoughts though, because I was like, well, how do you how do you push messages and make sure that you don't have anyone just push into it? Because like with Firebase, you can set up uh, um, domains that you can come from, which you know I like I like that idea. So then you don't have to expose a some secret keys or anything. Yeah, which uh, this service pretty much you just take a payload and pass it around. Um, Firebase is persistent, and you know, like it, it's nice because they they always say that it's kind of like your um, shared state, like shared application state, like real time type thing, uh, which is nice. And Uh, this there's another there's an article about um, using the library and the you know what you kind of what you might have done before like with pulling your server and everything and kind of get an idea of how to use that that's uh, that's on pushers pusher.com on their blog site so uh, they've got they've got articles for all other types of technologies too for however they do stuff so. If there's any other questions, so, small question. Do you happen to know like what is the uh, how generous are they with the uh, messages per day on the free account? Um, I think the free one might be like a hundred thousand per month, but it's like yeah. two hundred connections or a hundred connections, I think. Um, Oh, per day. Okay. Or, yeah. Hundred thousand messages per day. Connections. It goes up for their basic pricing. It goes up to one ninety nine a month for five thousand connections and ten million messages per day. Wow. Which I don't think. Do you have those types of limits like with Firebase? Yeah, I don't know if they say if there's a limit to the message size on here. But um <coughs> And I don't know how long that they're persisted either. So, I mean, you could there's a lot of other technologies out there like for um which some of them like Iron MQ or you know like where they're just message queues type things and can do broadcast stuff and uh, some really neat things. But I don't know how many of those have client side APIs. But uh, it'd be interesting to see modules wrapped up that way too. So, so messages per day. This is interesting. Messages per day are counted as the sum of the messages you receive through the API those they deliver to the connections. So if you okay. have, you know, 100 people connected and you make one push from your server, then that's 101 messages that you've used up. Okay. And they, they say a use case is like real-time gaming uh, for this. So that, that could, you know, quickly get up, you know, to a lot of messages, especially if you have... 5,000 Mm-hmm. So like any service though. Yeah. yeah. True. But do you really want to write your own concurrent layer, you know, message? Um, I'm gonna so like I kinda moved over to Ember and there there's a library for Ember too, um, to be able to use. And uh 
so yeah, so the, the basic idea is that when you push down or any kind of changes, you can you can push it out to other services that are subscribed to it. So, you know, you have a dashboard so we can see like, you know, when people log in or when people sign up for the service and we can get a real time feed of, you know, new activity and, you know, whatever we want to see on it. So. Yeah, just, I mean, anytime you want to expose a message, I mean, expose something that's happening, because it's kind of, uh, I like the, the pub sub or the broadcast type service, it likes have small services doing things and then be able to drop something somewhere. So to me, it, to me, it's working kind of like a message queue type thing. So, and, you know, the clients don't really have to persist that data. They could, you store it in a database somewhere and then pull it up. So like, like the server that I have in this demo is, um, is uh, just, you know, in memory cache of like those items. So then when you, you know, first connect, you get the current state of it, but then any updates you get just come from the pusher service. So you don't pull from your, you know, database every time. So. Yeah, I would have. Uh, I would have liked to build. It could be an option to build it somewhere to uh, with Firebase. I don't know. Or no, I think that there's some other s services out there where you can host like a some type of API service or something like where you can store that information. But I don't know. I don't know about executing code on it. That'd be. Yeah. Yeah, so that's like that's opening up the direct connection, the uh, sockets. Yeah, sockets directly on the on your server. So.